on the 14th of August, 2005, at 7.30. By the way, viewer discretion is advised. This probably will wind up being disturbing for, for certain individuals. Uh, continue at Helios Airways Flight 522, a flight scheduled to travel from Cyprus to Prague via Athens, was stuck on a loop 35,000 feet in the sky, and there had been no communication from the plane for over an hour. In a state of confusion, the Greek army sent two F-16 fighter jets to investigate, but as one of the pilots glanced a view inside what is the aircraft, saying, yeah? they saw that disaster was about to unfold, because the pilots were nowhere to be seen. What? They were about to witness one of the worst airplane disasters in European history, and it left. Bro, holy shit. Okay, yeah, viewer discretion is advised, obviously. Holy shit. Okay, here we go, Everyone chat. on the ground with one question. What happened to Helios Flight 522? Dude, no X, why are you eating like a motherfucking giraffe at the bottom left? Eating like a giraffe, dude. <laughs> What happened? Look at this chat. Oh, I hate to point it out. Oh, no uh, Alright, to be fair, it, it was spaghetti. So there is going to be leftover like spaghetti that you don't get in your mouth because you like bite it, right? So, alright, I got to I gotta cool it. I'm sorry, X. It was spaghetti. It makes sense. See, anything else, I was criticizing why, like him like putting the food in his mouth and then like a lot of it not making it in his mouth and falling out. But it's spaghetti, so you're normally not gonna get it all. You know what I'm saying? Probably gonna have to bite it. Let's get so sidetracked. <laughs> uh, a loud banging noise. Okay, here we go. The story of Helios Flight 522 began at 9 p.m. on Saturday, the 13th of August, 2005, when a Boeing 737 aircraft, nicknamed Olympia, departed London Heathrow for Larnaca, Cyprus. The plane was owned by Helios Airways, a low-cost Cypriot airline that chartered flights between Cyprus and the rest of Europe. The flight was, initially, fairly uneventful. But then the crew heard something strange. <coughs> a loud banging noise was coming from one of the plane's doors. Upon further inspection, it also seemed that the seal around the door was frozen. Following procedure, one of the flight's crew members made a note of the incident in the aircraft cabin Wait, defect what? log. And when the plane landed at Larnaca Airport at 1.25 a.m. local time, those notes were passed to the captain for review, who personally spoke to the ground engineer team to ensure a full inspection was carried out. And with well. that, the crew left, and a full inspection began. The man in charge of the inspection okay. was 44-year-old Alan Irwin, a well-liked and hands-on engineer from the UK who had been hired by Helios Airways on a six-month contract. Following standard operating procedure for a Boeing 737, Alan carried out a cabin pressurization leak check to test the integrity of the door. To do this, he and his team needed to manually pressurize the plane while it was still on the ground. Oh. As part of that process, Alan switched something known as the pressurization mode selector located on the cockpit panel from auto to manual. It's important to remember that a plane's onboard pressurization system ensures that the plane is adequately oxygenated as it gains altitude. This is something that is always done automatically, but a manual option is available in order to perform on-the-ground tests. Mm, However, going okay. through this process, Alan and the rest of his team were unable to recreate the problem. And so, after carrying on with other routine checks, he noted down that there were no known defects, they forgot no to turn leaks, back on. and no abnormal noises. Alan and the rest of his team felt that the onboard pressurization system was working just fine. This is the moment that starts off a chain of events that will seal the fate of everyone on board. Because the pressurization mode selector had not been set back to auto. God damn it, man. Uh... On Sunday the 14th of August. Ch a system this big and this important for a cabin, um, wouldn't it be like part of like a routine check before the before takeoff or something like that? I feel like Oxygen is like in the top pretty important five things you need. Yeah, pretty but, important. But to fucking live, mother sucker. Mother sucker. 2005, at 3:15 a.m. local time, the aircraft was released for its 6 a.m. flight. To be to fair, Prague. though, they probably just expect like that's a thing that 
probably never gets turned on, and when it does, they just expect it to get turned, like, it never gets turned to, to manual, and when it does, they just expect motherfuckers to turn it back to auto. You know what I'm saying? So they probably don't check it. Via Athens. <clears throat> Fast forward to 5am, the crew for flight 522 arrived an hour before departure to complete a standard pre-flight briefing. Which, that's wild that, like, it doesn't automatically switch back or something. Due to or, like, there's not, like, a button, like, we 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 going off like, hey, we don't think that's fucking oxygen, man. Yes, there had been some difficulty in putting together a full crew. Luckily, oh. two attendants, Luisa Volterra and Andreas Prodromo, were able to fill in last minute. Initially, Andreas was reluctant to join the crew, but would eventually agree after discovering that his girlfriend, also a flight attendant, was serving as a member of the cabin crew on that particular flight. The four flight attendants would join 59-year-old Captain Hans Jürgen Merton and 51-year-old First Officer Pampos Harolambos, two experienced pilots with a collective 23,000 hours of flying experience between Holy them. Holy shit, Together, chat, this crew of six would serve 115 passengers, around a third of whom were children. As the cabin crew were preparing for takeoff, they a knew that this would be an easy and short shit. flight with experienced pilots, but what they didn't know is that Hans was fired three months earlier by British airline Jet 2 for repeated years, yeah. failures to comply with standard procedures. Chad, that seems pretty standard, right? Six people? Six people crew for a plane this size? A 737? In fact, nobody knows this. Not even Helios themselves. Because I'm gonna Hans be honest, six people? On, how many people are on that plane? Because, like, six people does not seem like nearly enough. You know what I'm saying? Six people seem, like, I think, like, 10 maybe at least 10 right it's references like whenever six asked people for. seems pretty slim. on top of this first officer pampos also has a record so they got like what the two pilots and then that leaves four people only four motherfuckers for everyone on the plane rushing through checklists and to make matters worse the two pilots don't exactly see eye to eye in fact pampos had complained multiple times about han's attitude and was actively seeking new employment Nonetheless, as passengers began to board the plane, Pampos and Hans worked through their standard pre-flight checklist. It is here that the string of catastrophic errors continued. Pre-flight checklists are lists of tasks that should be performed by pilots and aircrew prior to takeoff. Yeah. In the cockpit, pilots will be working through multiple lists designed to ensure that all switches and indicators are in the correct positions. But Flight 522 was slightly behind schedule. And so, as both Hans and Pampos rushed through their checklists, they both failed to register that the pressurization mode selector was still on manual. At 6.07 a.m., seven wow. minutes behind schedule, the aircraft took off from Larnaca Airport. For the first few minutes, everything seemed perfectly normal. Four minutes after takeoff, at 6.11 a.m., ground control cleared Flight 522 for a final cruising altitude Wait, of bro, 34... Wait, bro, 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 this is really fucking scary now that I'm watching this. Jesus Christ, the... bro, this is incredibly scary. ...thousand feet. Yeah. And the plane began its climb through the clear blue All it takes is, which I'm assuming they've changed it now, right? But all it would take is someone to forget one fucking thing. It's sky. It should be said at this point that only the last few hours of in-flight cockpit recordings are actually available. And so much of this story has been pieced together using the in-flight data recorder, on-the-ground recordings, and testimony, as well as clues from the crash site. And what this all shows is that due to the pressurization mode selector still being set to manual, the cabin was not automatically pressurizing, meaning the air was getting thinner oh. and there was increasingly less oxygen. And by the time that it was time to fix it, basically the dudes were getting, they're like yeah. high, right? They, they, yeah, they're like hypoxia. Everybody, everybody's brain dead. Headed. Nobody can do anything. Even though multiple indicators on the... That's fucking terrifying, bro. Oh my God. The dashboard clearly showed that the altitude inside the cabin was abnormally high. For some reason, neither Hans nor Pampos, two pilots with tens of thousands of hours of flight experience between them, noticed. At 12,000 feet and climbing, yet another fatal and inexplicable error was made no, when masks. a loud alarm started sounding in the cockpit. Because the pilots had missed the earlier signs that the cabin was not adequately pressurizing, they, thought it was something they else, misread huh? this loud alarm as an yeah. erroneous takeoff configuration warning. In other words, a glitch. This was, in fact, the cabin altitude warning it alarm. Must. Bro, what? A glitch? Why would you just be like, oh, it's just a glitch? Hello? Bro, you guys got so much fucking. Oh my yeah, god. The two sound exactly the same. 
where the alarm sounds indicates which it is, and when it sounds off in the air, it means one thing and one thing only, that there is an immediate and urgent issue with the cabin pressurization, and that oxygen masks should be worn immediately. Neither Hans nor Pampos did this. Instead, at 6.14am, Hans made a call down to the Helios dispatcher on the ground. Jesus Christ, dude. At this first he mentioned the erroneous takeoff configuration warning, which was sounding in the cockpit. This confused the dispatcher, because a takeoff configuration alarm cannot sound at 12,000 feet in the air. And so, he handed the call over to Alan Irwin, the on-duty ground engineer who had performed the plane's inspection. So, 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 the thing that's going off is something that should, that should, or that normally only goes off when they're on the ground. Correct? Is that, is that what I'm getting correctly? And the fact that it was going off in the air made him think that it was a glitch. Right? Earlier is that what I'm, day, is that what I'm catching things on? became even stronger. Wait, chat. So they both failed then? Right? The or captain began to radio down about a ventilation cooling system error. He stated that, quote, the ventilation cooling fan lights were off. Then, moments later, he directly contradicted himself. To Alan, who was listening in on the ground, the conversation was as confusing as it was bizarre. But perhaps, Alan thought, Hans is confusing two lights that sit closely together. And it was at this point that he asked the captain about the pressurization mode selector. To which he received no reply. Oh no, fuck off. Fuck. Damn. Alan didn't realise it at the time, but Hans was behaving strangely because he and his co-pilot were both suffering from rapid onset hypoxia, a condition whereby the body is deprived of oxygen. I just said something by accident, drunk PLS sunbound. Holy shit, bro. The effects of hypoxia this on the human body are strange. At first, the vision worsens slightly. Chat. And then... Chat, look. Uh, they may have the video. I, the video is so good. And I, I think it's... it's it's worse for context now. It's it's good. It's good. It's good. It's good. I think it's like a TikTok or some shit. Oh, he's gonna watch a video on hypoxia. Starved my brain of oxygen today, and it might save my life. This room has had most of its Whoa. oxygen sucked out, leaving it at the. Look, it's worth it. Watch it. Don't get mad. I like the this. Today I like to this. Figure out what my Actually, symptoms of hypoxia are, so if I ever feel that way while flying, I can hopefully fix the problem before I pass out and crash. If I say climb, you're gonna raise your hand. If I say level off, you're back to back to center. Climb. Level off. Level off. Level off. Left turn. Left turn. Level off. Right climbing turn. Point at me. Point at me. Touch your nose. Point at me. Touch your nose. Point at me. Touch your nose. Oh my god. Mask on. Dude, that's whoo. Okay, chat. That's what. Holy shit, Chad. Dude, this is my guy. <laughs> oh, 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 you did the blocks yet? <laughs> what? Dude, holy shit. That's wild, bro. That's actually wild. And this, this is to show what those pilots are starting to experience, man. Holy fuck. <laughs> square. Are you sure that <laughs> Square? Is that, is that what? That is a square? <laughs> a square. Are you sure that's this one? Oh, you're starting to have a little shake there, you know, that lack of oxygen. You need to start thinking about getting back on oxygen now, Destin. Alright. Anyway, I'll finish the video. Holy like shit. A... That's Confusion wild. and disorientation begin to set in, quickly followed by a lack of coordination, and then a mood change, which for some can be extreme irritability, and for some, euphoria. What is particularly terrifying about hypoxia is that one of the symptoms can be a disassociation from the self, meaning sometimes people cannot truly grasp what is happening to them. Because Hans and Pampos did this not immediately so... put on their oxygen masks in response to the alarm, so at 15,000 feet and climbing, 
These symptoms were coming on very quickly. And as they set in, a warning light, known as the Master Caution Light, came on to indicate that masks have now dropped inside the passenger cabin. Those masks were able to distribute approximately 12 minutes of oxygen per person, more than enough for a plane to descend to a safe and breathable altitude. This was yet another warning that something was wrong with the cabin pressurization system. Jesus, man. But it was too late. Both pilots <coughs> were now too impaired to understand what was happening, and they were unable to work through the problem logically. Instead, both pilots got distracted by the equipment cooling light, which came on because the onboard computer systems were not being cooled properly due to the inadequate pressurization. And it was this that both pilots chose to focus on in their increasingly hypoxic state. Hans believed that it could be fixed by a system reset, and down on the ground, Alan, still baffled, continued to ask Hans about the pressurization mode selector. Hans ignored him and demanded to know where the circuit cooling breakers were, to which Alan replied, behind your seat. 13 minutes after the flight took off, at 6.20 a.m., the line went silent. And Alan, confused but satisfied that he had answered all of the captain's questions, went home. Bro, At this point, what? Passengers inside. Tell me what you went home, bruh. The fuck? Cabin would have only <coughs> had a few minutes of oxygen left. We can never know what happened in that cabin, but we can reasonably assume that there would have been panic and confusion. Following procedure, the cabin crew would have been seated, waiting for the pilots to perform an emergency descent to a safe altitude. Instead, the plane was on autopilot and was continuing its climb to 34,000 feet. Jesus All the while, Christ, the cabin man. crew would have been aware that the masks were fast running out of oxygen. Yeah, I'm confused here. As the passengers and the crew were struggling in their last moments of consciousness, at 6.29 a.m., the Helios dispatcher who initially took the call from Hans contacted ground control at nearby Nicosia Airport. He stated that he hadn't been able to make further contact with Flight 522 for nine minutes. The dispatcher at Nicosia Airport also failed to reach the cockpit, and at 6.36 a.m., 16 minutes after last contact... Wait, wait, so tell me that... Uh, okay, I don't want to stop the video, but listen. Out of four crew members, I stopped none of them time. realized that they were still going up when the mass has been down for like 10, 8 minutes, whatever the fuck, and nobody did anything. Fact, Flight 522... To be fair, those... It's not just the pilots that are suffering from altitude sickness, it's probably everybody, you know what I'm saying? Two began to enter Athens airspace. No, not probably, it is everybody. ...over to Athenian air control. <coughs> over the next 40 minutes, the air control center team at Athens and several Hi, planes yeah. in the vicinity they, they, they had attempted mass, no? and failed to make contact. Over 30 calls were made across... They did get the mat, ooh. That is a weird one, because like... They probably w had hypoxia a little bit, but they did get the masks, you know what I'm saying? So who who knows? We, we really will never know. Let's just keep watching. There was, of course, radio silence. Flight 522 still looked as if it was operating as normal, leading teams on the ground to theorize that there was an issue with the onboard radio system. At 7.20 a.m., Flight 522 began what looked like a standard approach procedure, but air control watched on in utter astoundment as the plane began to slowly turn back around in the same direction that it came, entering what is known as an automated holding pattern as part of its missed approach procedure over the Greek island of Kea. And it was here that Flight 522 stayed, flying around on a repeated loop. At this point, Bruh. teams on the ground knew that something was desperately wrong. By 8.23 a.m., the emergency level was elevated to alert. The Hellenic Air Force had been contacted, and two F-16 fighter aircraft were dispatched. Just nine minutes later, at 8.32 a.m., the two F-16 pilots described the disaster that was about to unfold what before can they everyone's do? eyes. Well, they can't do anything, right? <coughs> Teams on the ground listened in horror as they were told that first... Question them. Maybe you guys don't know about this, but listen. If, if let's say they knew what was going on and it was GG, right? And they were flying above like a very populated area. Would they shoot it down at the correct like timing so that people don't on the ground aren't hit Stryfusa by it? Officer Pampos Haralambos was slumped over the control that's panel. Good question. And Captain I don't know. Captain Hansjörg Merton was nowhere that's to be a, seen. That's a tough call, Later, man. Later, they would find out that he had passed out, searching for the switch behind his seat. No one was flying that plane.
The two F-16 pilots went on to describe how all passengers were sat completely motionless, with their oxygen masks dangling uselessly above them. I saw two so they never, they never even got passengers on the left that. side of the aircraft. They were sat motionless in their seats and were wearing oxygen masks on oh, their so faces. That's when I saw additional oxygen masks dangling from the passengers' overhead units. Even though the passenger cabin was dark, I could see the shadow of the oxygen hoses and masks against the daylight shining through the windows on the other side of the passenger cabin. Jesus Christ. The emergency bro. level was now set to the Way highest to possible as that. rescue teams on the ground attempted to make sense of this horrifying new information. And then, at 8.49 a.m., during the plane's tenth holding pattern, the F-16 pilot observed someone slowly making their way to the cockpit. Oh. The person put on a pair of headphones and placed their hand on the controls in front of them. What? But just one minute later, the left engine stopped working due to fuel deprivation, and the plane, all of a sudden, Wait, began what? to rapidly descend. The following conversation is recorded between the two F-16 pilots and the rescue teams on the ground. <laughs> It's at this point that they realize that the person in the cockpit is Andreas Prodromu, one of the flight attendants who agreed to fill in for a sick colleague at the last moment. Andreas, investigators would later find out, was a qualified pilot, and it appeared that he was controlling the plane. But he had no training on a Boeing 737, oh, and the shit. plane was now rapidly losing altitude at a rate of around 1,500 feet per minute. Jesus. I mean, what is he going to do? The F-16 pilots desperately tried to make visual contact, but Andreas was not responding. Why, was he buzzing Instead, as well? the words, Mayday, Mayday, Mayday. This is Helios Airways Flight 522, was weakly spoken into the cockpit radio, which was set to the wrong frequency. These recordings would later be recovered from the crash site. But as the plane was going down, Holy Andreas shit. was speaking into the void. Of the cockpit. Holy fucking shit, Chad. So the dude went over to pass it out, they probably missed the settings and they changed frequency. Don't say it, Chad. Oh my god. 59 a.m., the right engine on the plane gave out. At this point, Andreas looked directly at the F 16 pilot, slowly lifted his hand and weakly pointed downwards. Dude, holy fuck, the plane's descent was happening so quickly that the teams on the ground were struggling to keep up. Jesus fucking Christ. Okay, um... Um, yeah, I'm going to skip the footage. That's, that's, 
Holy shit, man. I did. A 186-page air accident investigation report was written. This report cited multiple failures to recognise the cabin pressurisation issues as they arose on the day, but they also revealed an ineffective and dangerous organisational culture that bent the rules beyond recognition. So it's the motherfucking... Chat, even Wait, with, with no how did that guy... I want to know how... I want to know how he, like, stayed awake. You know what I'm saying? Or, like, woke up. Like, how does that... On that specific, specific plane, there's nothing you could do to, to maneuver it or whatever, or, like, a... In the absence of all but the last hour of the cockpit voice recorder, one question is often asked about Helios Flight 522. Why did the cabin crew not immediately enter the cockpit? Mm. And if they did, why did they not make contact with teams <coughs> on the ground over the radio? Yep. This is especially puzzling considering that they had access to several hours of oxygen, as well as- Wait, what? As clearly the cockpit access code. But even the report itself states that it is rather puzzling. But perhaps the on-plane oxygen system can give us a clue. Because of the way the emergency oxygen system works on a plane, it's likely that the adult passengers would have run out of oxygen first. The crew had access to four emergency oxygen cylinders, and we know that three of them were used. But how and in what way they were used were found with the valves in the open position. So they were used. Oh Manner is unclear. Wait. Is it possible that some of the cabin crew may have attempted to share their masks with, say, one or several of the flight's younger passengers? If this did happen, this would have created an extremely dangerous situation, because at 34,000 feet, the effects of hypoxia set in at around 30 seconds, making the window for what is referred to as useful consciousness very short indeed. Bro, that's fucking Perhaps in order to help the passengers, it, the crew inadvertently incapacitated themselves. Perhaps this was done in the time that their own masks ran out on their way to the emergency oxygen cylinders. Or perhaps Andreas incapacitated himself helping his partner. These are of course just theories, because ultimately, we will never know. Wait, wait. So I'm guessing if it's at the back, whatever, Holy they have to get to the shit. front or like into the cabin and they have to get, they get the oxygen there. They can't make. Yeah, they have to get the. Oh my it's god. It's not possible in that time frame. Yeah, especially if like the cart's there, because the cart can be in the middle and the cart like blocks, it like puts a big block in the plane. Helios right? Airways continued operations until November 2006, but sustained massive losses and eventually went out of business. In 2007, several families of those who died in the crash sued Boeing for 76 million euros. The lawyer leading the case highlighted. Wait, the what? Sued Boeing for 76 million euros. Oh, okay. The lawyer leading the case highlighted that having the same alarm in place for two different types of dysfunction, one relatively minor and the other with potentially devastating consequences, was negligent. That is pretty negligent. Let's be real. All parties that is, ended up to be fair, out of court. So I, so I was right about the, about the alarm that like it goes off on the ground, and when it goes off on the ground, it's just, it's like kind of like a minor thing that they gotta fix or whatever the fuck. But then when it actually takes off, and then it goes off for the anti whatever no oxygen thing. Then it, whoo, and then that's wild, in two thousand and eight, four nice Helios officials, including Alan Irwin, were charged with manslaughter. And after a complicated legal battle with the Greek courts, were all eventually found guilty in April 2012. By 2013, however, Alan Irwin had successfully appealed. Other Helios officials were sentenced to 10 years, but were all ultimately able to pay their way out for 79,000 euros. What? This has angered some, who feel that to they this day, way out. justice has not been served. Today, a memorial dedicated to the victims has been built on the crash site. Oh, nice. It stands that's, as that's, a reminder I mean, of the lives lost in this unbelievable... At least they fucking built something. ...tragedy. Yeah, X, money's... money's different in different that's places. nothing. Aftermath. Wait, wait, go back. Or put in place. Okay. <coughs> in 
install two. Two warning lights, huh? One for the takeoff. I mean, bro. Air crash breakdown vips up of content. Do more. Alan maintains that he and the team did set the preservation mode sector back to auto that day. Bro. Yeah, that was that that was that was be mind boggling to be honest though. Jesus. That was wild. That is that is absolutely cooked up for sure. Okay. What else? Yeah, that was absolutely fucking insane. Holy shit. This one was a lot I mean I can't say it was a lot crazier than the other one that I watched than this one. Flight three seventy, because that that flight literally just disappeared, which is wild. But this one's like, this is like a like a scary, scarier situation that like has a way higher probability of happening. You know what I mean?